thrilled to see such a large number of people here, especially because this is a very special lecture tonight. It's not the typical one, but we're here to celebrate the 30th anniversary of a great partner of this national park, which is Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And this month, I believe, September, is that right, is the actual anniversary of the Marine Sanctuary. And so to highlight that, we're also going to be seeing a premiere of the new sanctuary film, which is called Beneath the Rainbow Bridge, A Journey Through the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And before we do that, though, I want to introduce the superintendent of National Marine Sanctuary, Chris Mobley. And Chris will be, in addition to showing the film for us, discussing a little bit about the future of the direction of the sanctuary, their research, their education, and their protection to help ensure a healthy ocean and healthy marine sanctuary for future generations as well. So with that, I'd like you to all please welcome Chris Mobley. Thanks, thanks everyone. Uh, before I start, how, how many Naturalist Corps, Channel Islands Naturalist Corps people are in the room? Raise your hands. These folks, for those of you who don't know, they volunteer their time to help lead hikes and go on whale watch trips and be naturalists for both the park and sanctuary. Um, how many folks here are from Ventura County? Show of hands. The majority, I expected that. Anybody from Santa Barbara County? All right. So. This is your park and sanctuary. Um, it's pretty amazing to have a national park and national marine sanctuary. Uh, from here, it's about 12 miles to the island, Anacapa Island, which means the park is about 11 miles away because it has a one mile boundary into the ocean. And it means the sanctuary is about six miles away because the sanctuary boundary goes out six miles from the island. So six miles from here, roughly, you would cross into the national marine sanctuary. And uh, this is in an area that has the greater population, the greater LA area of about 18 million people. And yet, for those of you who have gone there, how many people here have been to the Channel Islands already? Um, for those of you who have gone there, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, place. And um, our mission, just along with the park, is our main mission is to protect this place uh, in perpetuity. So it's our 30th anniversary. How many people here remember when it was became a park and sanctuary 30 years ago. So the hope is, you know, it'll be another 30 years, 30 years, 30 years in perpetuity as long as this, this country's here, this will be a national park and national marine sanctuary for you and your descendants to enjoy and it will be protected. There are uses there such as fishing, but those have to be managed so they're sustainable and they don't um, <laughs> impair uh, the long-term functionality of, of, those, of that place. So. That's our main mission, and we can't do it without you. So I'm glad to see this great turnout. Um, it's there for us to protect, but also for us to enjoy. So we need to reach everyone so that they understand how wonderful this place is, and so they support protecting it and help protect it, either by volunteering in the Natural Score or doing many other things. So one of the ways we're trying to expand our reach and expand people's awareness and understanding of what's out there is through a center we're trying to build called Octos. And I have some brochures here about it, and I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But basically, right now, we're building a new building on the UC campus. Um, and it's got two wings. One wing will ho hold our administrative offices, and the other wing will hold this facility called Octos, which stands for Outreach Center for Teaching Ocean Science. And um, by being at the university, we already do a lot of research uh, partnerships with them. But there's a synergy there that will allow us to raise our game on our science and our monitoring, but also working with the university to reach all ages in this education center. It's going to be for you, for your kids, for everyone um, to take advantage of. And if someone goes to a different school, whether it be Oxford College or Cal State Channel Islands or any other school, um, they're also welcome to participate at Octo. So I want, we also, the other main pitch here is we need to raise money. The, the uh, building itself uh, is being built with federal funds that were uh, spent several years ago. Um, so the building shell of Octos is already paid for by, the, by your taxes, thank you. Uh, but then all the exhibits that have to go inside, we have to raise the funds for that. So we're forming a community steering committee to help raise funds for that. And um, if any of you are interested in that, um, you'd want to contact Laura Francis. I have some of her cards. 
or she's just laura.francis at noaa.gov. She's looking for people, especially if you have experience in fundraising, to help us raise funds. So to hopefully pique your interest and get you excited, I'm going to show a little clip about Octos. Often called the American Galapagos, the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary is a living laboratory for exploration, discovery, and learning. The amazing and diverse underwater habitats make the sanctuary an excellent place for scientific discovery. The Marine Science Institute at UCSB and the sanctuary are working together to create OCTOS, the Outreach Center for Teaching Ocean Sciences. At OCTOS, students from kindergarten to college will be engaged in innovative, hands-on programming. It is, and what is the warrant to be fish called? Students and teachers will be immersed in the process of marine science and learn about what they can do to take care of our oceans. It does this by tapping into our most valuable resource, UCSB students. Dynamic exhibits, such as the Immersion Theater, will allow students to talk to scientists in the field. Students will be engaged with a unique learning experience called the Magic Planet, and with the touch of a button, will gain a new perspective on the Earth's processes, such as hurricanes, sea surface temperature, and ocean currents. By monitoring the abundance and diversity of plants and animals along a transect on the seafloor, students will become scientists and will investigate real scientific data. Through amazing aquaria and out of this world totally interactive exhibits that empower visitors with an understanding and an ability to do the science dedicated to protecting these valuable resources, Octos is more than just an aquarium. It's a really cool school of ocean discovery. Through their experience at Octo, students begin to understand the important role oceans play in our planet and to see the opportunities for solving key global issues through the study of science. In this way, Octos will inspire the scientists and science teachers of tomorrow. I believe the memories, they look so so pretty when I sleep hey, now and, and when I wake up You look so pretty Sleeping next to me But there is Not enough time There is no No song I could sing Alright, so anybody here interested in going to Octos when it's completed? Any of you kids? <laughs> So the main features, I don't even need to show the PowerPoint. The main features, as you saw in the slideshow, are uh, there's a classroom. There's going to be a lab where people can do hands-on experiments with live creatures. Then there's going to be um, this exhibit space that has these interactive exhibits, uh, such as the Magic Planet and a virtual transect that will be populated with real data and can be changed as we get different data sets from all over the world. It could be coral reefs in Indonesia or it could be kelp forests here in Channel Islands on that virtual transect. And then the last thing will be this immersion theater, which is an interactive theater where you can sit in your chair, you can be transported somewhere across the world talking to a research scientist as they're doing their research and, and interact with them through the internet. Um, the Jason project, which has come here in the past, is the same type of project, but this would be a permanent facility where people from this region can ha have those kinds of experiences um, on a regular basis. So we're excited about that, but as you can see, it's pretty high-tech stuff. We've got to raise a fair amount of money for that. So anybody who's interested in being on the Community Steering Committee to help raise the funds, um, contact Laura Francis. You saw her on the little clip. So with that, I'll transition now to the film, I'll give a little introduction and then we'll get right into it and then we'll have a little time uh, at the end for questions. So um, for several years now we've been working with John Brooks. John Brooks is an award-winning filmmaker. He's worked with James Cameron who directed the Titanic. He works both underwater and he also does a lot of 3D work. So for those of you who saw U2's Rattle and Hum, John Brooks was one of the main cameramen for that. Um, but he also has another job 
working for NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, in their Ocean Media Center. And since we're part of NOAA too, and he lives right here in Ventura, he teamed up with us to work to get underwater footage and above water footage. And so we have now over 20 hours of footage covering all different subjects. And uh, we plan to make a lot of different film products with all this footage. Um, we already are putting clips on our website. We're putting things on Google Ocean. We'd like to share the footage with others so they can make their own uh, films interpreting what they experience out there in their own way. But the first product we're premiering tonight is the long film. It's about almost a half hour. I think it's about 27 minutes. And it kind of covers a wide range of topics. It's intended not to be bureaucratic. The goal is for, to help people connect to the place. It's an amazing place, and especially underwater. How many people here are scuba divers? So everybody who's not a scuba diver, maybe you've snorkeled, but it's really hard to see what's under there um, so through film, uh, or in this case, high definition video, we can take you there and you can see what it's like down there. And I have to tell you, I, I was on a lot of these dives to get this footage. You can see this stuff that you're seeing in this piece, in this film, anytime you go out there. It is an amazing thing to see. It is so rich with life, as you will soon see. And so um, for the non-divers or folks that uh, have physical challenges, this is a way for them to connect and see this place, hopefully get inspired to help us protect it. Because as I said before, the only way we're going to protect this for our children and future generations is if we all work, work together on that. Um, I want to just mention a couple people that are in, were involved. Laura Francis was a major producer of this. You saw her earlier in the other piece. She's one of our education and outreach coordinators. And I'd also like to mention the Chumash community and the Chumash Maritime Association. You'll see that they're in some different segments of this film. They're very graciously uh, collaborated with us on this. And we believe that the messages that they bring, having been at the islands for 13,000 years and having as part of their culture uh, a, a strong belief in stewardship for the long term, we believe that, that the messages that they work with us in putting into the film are, are very valuable. So with that, enjoy Beneath the Rainbow Bridge. Earth, an island ecosystem with finite resources, suspended in an infinite universe. The connection between this universe and life is water, the birthplace of all life. Water creates island ecosystems. It protects them and at the same time makes them fragile. Just 60 miles from Los Angeles, California is the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. 1,500 square miles of protected Pacific Ocean surrounding the Channel Islands National Park. Five unique islands. Santa Barbara. Anacapa. Santa Cruz. Santa Rosa. San Miguel and the water surrounding them create one of the most unique island ecosystems in North America. The biological diversity found here is nothing short of amazing. This special place holds secrets of science, riddles of nature, and the voices of ancestors.
Visitors come here seeking solace, knowledge, sustenance, and adventure. They wisely harvest the bounty, so it is always here for the future. Much of the past remains unchanged in the present. Humans rely on consumption for survival and will always be part of this ecosystem. The evolved mind thrives on curiosity, thought, and ritual. These things have all carried forward from a time before and will be passed on. The value in this passing is measured by the health of this special place and all its ecosystems. My people, the Chumash, were born here. We were the original caretakers of these islands. We thrived because of the bountiful resources. These resources allowed us to build a strong, highly developed society. Our history is carried down through song, dance, and storytelling. Traditions that continue today. This is an old time story, the Rainbow Bridge story. Long, long ago, our people lived only on the islands. The islands became very crowded, and this was not healthy for the people or for the islands. Creator told the people some must move to the mainland and made them a rainbow bridge to cross over from the islands. Creator warned them, do not look down as you cross the bridge or you will fall. But some looked down and fell into the sea. Not wanting the fallen ones to perish, Creator transformed them into dolphins so they could live a good life in the sea forever. Our connection to the sea is also forever. It's coming. All of our existence is connected to the sea. Our survival depends on its well-being and wise use of its resources. The place where the land connects with the sea is a place of both turmoil and quiet reflections that lead into the water where the kelp forest begins. This wilderness beneath the sea is like a rainforest. Dappled sunlight passes through the fronds in the dense canopy illuminating a world below like no other on Earth. Here in the sanctuary, cold water currents from the north collide with warm currents from the south. This mixing allows a broad diversity of species to exist in a small geographical area. The kelp forest supports over a thousand different plants and animals. It is one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. The giant kelp can be found as deep as 100 feet and can grow an astonishing two feet a day. These massive undersea forests provide great habitat for animals, all the way from the surface 
to the rocky reef below. As we move through the water, we encounter schools of swimmers. Massive schools of bait fish band together for protection to confuse predators. Like the harbor seal. Fish like this toothy lingcod stay in the rocky crevices, only venturing up to feed on smaller fish. The torpedo ray glides through the kelp, looking for prey. It stuns fish by discharging a strong electric shock. Bat rays work the bottom, looking for clams that they can crush with their powerful jaws, spitting out the shell and feasting on the tasty morsels inside. These sand areas around the kelp forest are difficult places for large animals to hide. But some, like this halibut, are perfectly adapted. Being flat, it remains unseen until it moves. The angel shark can lay motionless undetected in the sand for days. Until an unsuspecting fish swims by, then it explodes out of the sand to feed. The kelp forest is a dynamic environment that changes seasonally and from year to year. To understand if a change is part of a normal process or caused by something out of balance, scientists monitor kelp forests systematically over time. They compare the health of marine protected areas where fishing is not allowed to areas that remain open to fishing. Dr. Jennifer Cassell and her team from the University of California at Santa Barbara are one of the groups that do the monitoring. We have a lot of historical records that show that the kelp forests in the Channel Islands ecosystems were much healthier years and years ago than they are now. And we'd like to find ways to move these ecosystems back to the way they once were. Things like marine protected areas will really help in this regard. Marine protected areas restore ecosystems to their natural state, and we think that healthier ecosystems are more resilient to climate change. We all know this is hugely important as we face climatic changes. We hope that the data we're collecting here on the marine protected areas in the Channel Islands will help us better understand how they work here and elsewhere. What I'd really love to see is these kelp forests restored to the way they were 50 or even 100 years ago. One fish that disappeared from the kelp forest fished to the very edge of extinction is the giant sea Fish are now making a slow comeback. They grow and reproduce very slowly. They are recovering because they have been protected for over 30 years. Marine protected areas and sustainable fishing practices by local fishermen are both tools used to help keep these ecosystems intact. As we move yeah. along the floor of the and so to highlight that area known as the Rocky Reef. 
Here, invertebrates colonize every available surface. Life is so dense, it forms a virtual living carpet. This well-armored sheep crab forages not only through the kelp forest, but out on the surrounding sand area and into the adjacent eelgrass. Eelgrass beds are rare here. Found in calm, soft bottom areas, they serve as nurseries for young fish and provide habitat for many others. Down inside the grass, there is another forest with its own set of very strange occupants. This pike blenny burrows in sand under the roots of the eelgrass. It is giving a display to attract a mate. Biologists keep track of the animals and plants here as well. They look for changes in the eelgrass that might indicate a change in the environment. The Channel Islands are a deceptive paradise. Located just a few dozen miles off of our coastline, they seem so far away from all of the human pollution and activities that we see along the mainland. However, they're connected to our mainland by water. So what goes into the water along the mainland can affect what we see at the islands. Fish that seabirds feed on are a link between the land and the sea. Years ago, millions of pounds of DDT, a pesticide, flowed into the ocean from industrial manufacturing on the mainland. It accumulated in the fish, which were the primary food source for the California brown pelican. The DDT caused the pelicans to lay thin-shelled eggs which were crushed during incubation, causing the pelican population to plummet. As a result, these birds were one of the first animals to be placed on the endangered species list. With the DDT production stopped in the 1970s, the pelicans have made a tremendous comeback and their populations are once again thriving. Pollution is not the only thing that has impacted seabirds in the islands. They have had to overcome other human-induced problems in order to survive. On a foggy night in December of 1853, a steamer, the Winfield Scott, hit a reef in the Channel Islands and sank, leaving behind one of many historic shipwrecks protected by the sanctuary and the park. This ship also left something else, black rats. The rats swam ashore and became permanent residents, surviving by preying on nesting seabirds and their eggs. A small seabird, the Xanthus murlet, was decimated by the rats. The birds are now banded with identifying numbers to keep track of the population size. Five, seven, five. During the breeding season, the trained biologists comb the fragile cliffs and sea caves to count nests and chicks. Evolutionarily and biologically, the most important part of a seabird's life is the breeding cycle. For Xanthus merlets, that occurs in the waters around plan. the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. And science teachers of tomorrow. You can see the tag. Mm -hmm. Two other sites right there. 
about 90% of the California population breed in and feed in the waters. All right, so anybody here interested in... The health of the islands and the waters around the islands are tantamount to the viable populations of merlots. With the rats now removed from the islands, scientists are hopeful the murlets will recover. Maintaining balance in an island ecosystem is a difficult process, but critical to its survival. And uh, we plan to make a lot of... The Northern Channel Islands are part of a ridge that rises up out of the deep ocean. Nutrient-laden waters are pushed into this ridge and then up to the surface, feeding abundant populations of plankton. Well, through film, uh, or in this case, it is an amazing thing to see. It is Barely visible to the naked eye, when viewed under a microscope, look like creatures from another world. Krill, a small shrimp-like crustacean, feed on the plankton. They form dense swarms so thick they can block out the sun. Schooling fish gorge themselves on this banquet. Pelicans plunge into the schools of fish. Their bodies protected from the impact with the water by air sacs buried just beneath their skin. Large groups of dolphins and and eat on the massive food source as well. Whales are here too. One third of the world's species of whales and dolphin are found in the sanctuary waters. The abundant food helps support healthy populations of animals here in the be part of this ecosystem, whole island ecosystem. But there are threats. Each year, thousands of cargo ships transit this channel, headed in and out of one of the busiest ports in the world. Los Angeles, nice. and all its equal resources. This traffic puts we is carried down for collisions. Biologist John Kalambokitis studies whales to understand how they react when a ship is nearby. He attaches a suction cup tag to the backs of whales. See forever. The tag carries an instrument that records how long a whale is on the surface, how long and how deep it dives. It also records whale vocalizations and all the sounds in the water, including passing ships. Where the kelp. Then, by increasing our understanding of whale activities, bronze and eliminating the shipping industry, we hope to find ways to avoid collisions. has this real interest in whales and a percent. Hey. When the reality is, we actually know a lot less than people think we do. And our passion for whales needs to be a representation of the marine environment and the protections that we put in for keeping the marine environment healthy, and that's what the whales are going to require to be out there. Fish band together for protection. Whales can easily die like this well. toothy lingcod, but for us to study these remote deep ocean areas requires specialized equipment. Dr. Milton Love is one of the lucky people that gets to visit this hidden wilderness. I love using manned submersibles. It's the highlight of my career. And when you're down 600 feet, 800 feet, 1,000 feet, and you know that no one else has been here before, it's a thrill every single time. 
Life forms that live below the reaches of sunlight are little understood and very fragile. Unlocking the secrets held in these depths can bring us discoveries beyond our wildest imaginations. Animals like this vampire squid. Scientists monitor kelp forests, the health of marine protected area, or this bizarre jelly. Spur our desire to explore and learn. Barriers of pressure and darkness are not enough to protect this fragile frontier. Only we can do that. Squid that it Move these and we'd like to find food source for elephant seals and sea lions. To reach this prey, both animals must have extraordinary diving abilities. Elephant seals visit the Channel Islands two times a year. Once to mate and have their young, and again to molt sea bass. These twice they leave on a long migration that takes them thousands of miles from the islands to feeding areas in the North Pacific. Sea lions, on the other hand, are full-time residents. They live and breed on the islands year-round. Dr. Sharon Moline and Tony Orr are two marine mammal scientists that spend a large part of their lives she on through the this kelp well forest studying sea lions. The California Channel Islands are the primary breed of California sea lions in the world. California sea lions are sensitive to even short-term changes in their environment. Because they are a coastal animal, they feed on the same things humans feed on. They inhabit the same waters that we inhabit as a species, and so if we start seeing them responding to a change in their of environment, the then we need to start looking at our own. Track of the that might animals actually and translate into a human effect as well. Humans have had a connection with this corner of the universe for thousands of years. We'll never change. ...of pounds of DDT. Our people continue to practice cultural traditions. We Brown share Pelican the caused the Pelican. our Rainbow Bridge story, illustrating the finite limits of resources and the need for preservation. This island ecosystem is a small reflection of Earth. What we see in this reflection can be an indicator for the whole planet. Its balance is greatly affected by people. We meet the future with our efforts to restore and protect both the cultural and natural resources. Through science, we look for paths to correct our past mistakes and way became permanent residents through a seabird the xanthus the birds are now many places and people to stimulate thought and action we hope it will bring appreciation biologists respect and understanding for a place where nature is bountiful but resources become limited with too much demand. All of us must continue to honor our responsibilities as caretakers. We must take serious for the future. This effort will be measured by what we leave to the generations that follow us. 
You should keep the ocean healthy because then all the creatures will be healthy. There are so many amazing things to learn about the ocean. The underwater world is so beautiful. Listen to these voices and remember, as the time before us and the present, the time that comes after us is a gift from the universe. The condition in which we leave this special place is our gift to the children. One third of the Help support healthy population. Questions? Now that, that was my question. How do you deal with the rat infestation? Uh, well, the park um, took the lead on that, and they actually had a uh, program where they took all the native mice into captivity to protect them, and then they put out um, poison and poisoned the rats on Anacapa Island. And then once the poison wore off, they were able to release the mice back into the wild. And it was successful. The nesting rates. Um, the nesting success rates of the seabirds on Anacapa Island have gone way, way up, and now the populations are growing while before they were declining and, and getting in serious trouble. So that was a very successful project. Question? When you're down there and you're counting the population, how do you... <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, well, we have uh, different methods that are sort of tested and been developed over the years. Obviously, you can't count everything. So one example is you use a transect, you lay out a tape, and it's either a randomized transect where you have a process to, to lay out the tape in a random manner and not sort of high grade where you put it, or there's set what's called fixed transects that like the, the National Park uses where they go to the same place every year and they have a line laid on the bottom that's permanently affixed so they can go back to the exact same spot. And then they lay those, those square quadrats, they're called, one meter square or half meter square uh, plastic square. And then the idea would be, for example, you count every single urchin in that plastic square. Or you count every single nudibranch in that plastic square. So you're not counting everything in the whole ocean, you're just counting what's inside that square. And uh, you, if you do the same thing year in, year out, you can detect things like changes in the urchin population or, or changes. And we also have a process for swimming and counting fish over a timed swim, Diving you can see changes in fish. Seal. So, another question? You, you've only shown 28 minutes of a 20 hour, uh, <laughs> uh, why not put them on DVD and sell them? Well, I don't know if any of you have ever shot a uh, video of your family, but uh, with, with ocean filming, you know, for every uh, hour of filming, you get maybe one good minute that's really worth keeping. So, uh, you know, I don't know how it is with your birthday parties and anniversaries, but similarly, we have a lot of footage. A lot of it has scientific value. We know the exact place and time and date that that footage was captured. And 50 years, 100 years from now, if there's been a shift uh, in the ecosystem, we can go back to these old, this old footage and compare. For example, the original, the park film that's still being shown until they get their new film, it shows in the... We need to start looking at our own. ...thick with black abalone, and now you don't see any black abalone. But if you go to that old film, you see what it used to be like with the black abalone. So these, this footage has actually scientific value as well as educational value. What sure. degrees are offered in this field at UCSB? 
Uh, well, there's a wide variety of degrees that apply to what we do, ranging from marine science, but plain old biology, zoology, um, what else? Uh, mathematics, you know, we have to use statistics to analyze all the data we get. Um, physics, we have to understand the oceanography of the ocean. Chemistry, we have to understand the chemistry of the ocean. So just about any science degree uh, applies out there, geology. Um, and then, of course, education degrees. If someone's becoming a teacher and they want to teach science, they need to learn how to educate. So, and even art majors. We need to connect people to this resource and sometimes artists and musicians, as you've seen in this film, there were a lot of artists and musicians and writers involved in making this film. Even someone who's in the humanities can play an important role in connecting people to this resource. So I would say almost any major um, can be involved in helping protect the islands. Is the film available for purchase? Um, the film, our intention is to make uh, a bunch of copies. It's in high definition format, so that would be Blu-ray. Uh, but also conventional DVD. Um, and then, of course, to schools and other public institutions, we would strive to make it available for free. For others, our intent would be to have a very minimal fee, essentially the cost of making the copy, which is a, a couple bucks that we'd ask to donate to, to a foundation so that we can keep making more and more copies without running out of funds. Um, so Laura Francis, I have her card here, but it's just Laura Francis at noaa.gov. Um, she's working on developing the, the process that we'll have to get copies out. So Laura's the one to contact, and uh, it may time. take us a few weeks um, to get it out, um, to make it freely available to everybody on demand. But is our gift. You can also go to our website. We have a lot of different clips, and we've put clips on our website and also on Google Ocean. And uh, we plan to put out a lot more different film products using all the footage we have. So contact Laura if you're interested in getting it. And there are eagles, and what was the reference to the black island? Uh, there are eagles. There's up the islands. There were golden eagles, which is act was actually a problem for the island fox. But now there's bald eagles back and nesting successfully on the islands. That's been a major restoration project done by both uh, the park and the Nature Conservancy. So that's been very successful. There are no condors out there. They're on the mainland. Uh, the reference to the Galapagos Islands is that this island ecosystem, like the Galapagos, is super diverse, super productive, um, and also contains a number of species, particularly on the land, like the island fox and the scrub jay and certain plants that uh, live nowhere else on Earth. You can only find them at the Channel Islands. Another question? No, and uh, I would have to guess that there, we wouldn't expect there to be. There's not a lot of um, cross movement between the Gulf of Mexico and these islands. However, there are a number of species on the islands ranging from birds to whales that migrate thick. <laughs> so it is true that things that happen in far corners of the Pacific to gray whales, blue whales, humpback whales, to shear, shear waters, and a lot of birds that travel long distances. Practices and activities that are happening all over the Pacific Ocean can affect um, the populations that then come to the islands. Another question? Sure. What, what do you perceive as being the, the, the top couple of threats to the environment or the ecosystems out there, and, and what steps are are you taking to uh, help remedy those, uh, those threats? Well, prior, prior to the, the, the climate and the whole change ocean. concern, uh, probably the most significant threats that we were trying to manage were uh, water quality threats. For example, DDT was a water quality impact. And uh, making sure that fishing is being managed so that it doesn't overfish uh, right. in the ecosystem there. Those were the two principal concerns. But now with climate change, which can affect temperature, it can affect the pH of the ocean, making the ocean more acidic. Um, that has the potential to have sweeping changes uh, to the islands. So for example, if the islands were to warm just a few degrees, that footage was captured, average temperature staying that much warmer, you would expect over time the islands to look more like Guadalupe Island in Mexico or other islands in Mexico 
and less like what they look like now, where you have a lot of the cold water species, especially at San Miguel Island, you'd expect the colder water species to start to, to fade out over time, uh, and kelp, for example, to possibly disappear, because kelp can only handle a certain temperature range. So that's the big concern. What can we do about it? Two things. One, we're doing a lot of research and monitoring, working with other agencies to try and start to get a handle on it. Uh, but second of all, it's, it's a much bigger problem. It's a global problem. So it's going to involve you know, multiple governments and people um, making changes that hopefully slow down the rate of CO2 being put into the atmosphere. How about the uh, sonar testing? Is that a problem? Um, sonar testing, there is the Navy range. Um, they have to comply with the Endangered Species Act. Whenever they use active sonar, they have to go through all kinds of hoops to minimize the risk to, to whales and other species and to have observers and so forth. So they, there's not zero risk, but they really are put under a lot of scrutiny to minimize the risk. Passive sonar, like people's fish finders and uh, what you have on your boats to measure the depth, all the research suggests that there's no significant impact of that on marine life at all. And then the other concern is just general marine noise. All the shipping in the channel, all that low frequency sound bounces around. And there's a lot of research that indicates that can affect some species. For example, large whales communicate with each other in those same low frequency spectrums. And uh, the analogy that's given by the whale biologists is it's easy for us to communicate, for me to communicate with you right now because the room's quiet. But imagine we're in a really loud party or everyone's talking. It's going to be a lot harder to understand what I'm saying. So whales, when they're communicating across the entire Channel Island Basin with each other, hey, there's food over here, or but uh, hey, in the would interim, you like to go out with me? Uh, you know, <laughs> suddenly there's, it's like they're in a large party and everybody's yelling and it's harder for them to, to communicate. So there's research, active research going on now trying to understand how that marine noise, which is quite it's measured and it's quite loud. It's one of the loudest underwater areas in the world with all the traffic. How that's affecting whale behavior and is it affecting their survival or their reproduction? Are they still fishing the sea bass? The, uh, the giant sea bass, they're not allowed to target, but if they, in other fisheries, if they incidentally catch, so they're trying to catch other fish, and if they happen to catch giant sea bass, that they're, allowed to keep, they're allowed to keep up to one per day under current fishing rules. And obviously, if they catch one and it's dead, they just throw it in the water. So there are still, there's still take of giant sea bass, but it's associated with fisheries that are targeting other species. But fortunately, now that they're no longer directly targeted, it appears that the population is growing and recovering. So they can withstand a certain level of take. They just couldn't handle, they couldn't handle the directed take that was uh, too high of a level. Question. Uh, that's it's kind of a complicated story. I'll try and simplify it. Um, the main shipping lane runs down the Santa Barbara Channel, as you know, and the California Air Resources Board, which manages air quality for California, um, from their research showed that roughly a quarter of the total pollution smog that we have here on the on the coastal areas comes from those ships. They burn really dirty diesel with no catalytic converters or anything, and they just pump raw exhaust into the atmosphere, and these are gigantic ships. So they imposed a rule that requires ships to either burn clean burning uh, low sulfur fuel or stay further offshore. And so what the shipping industry has done is over half, some of them have switched to the cleaner fuel, but over half of them decided to stay offshore as long as possible to travel on the back side of the islands, on the south side of the islands, and then cut into LA Long Beach at the last possible minute so they minimize the time that they have to spend burning the more expensive clean fuel. And so now approximately half the large shipping traffic is now on the back side of the islands. So the Coast Guard's actually about to conduct a, a formal study to consider do they need to create formal lanes on the back now since so many of the ships are going that way. However, EPA has proposed a rule like the California rule that would say you got to burn clean fuel in a much broader uh, area of the ocean going much further offshore. Uh, and if they do that, then the ships, no matter where they go, they're going to need to burn clean fuel. So chances are, once that rule goes through, they'll end up coming back into the existing shipping lanes inside the channel. Um, but that's all 
kind of in, in flux right now. And the other issue with whale strikes, we have had ships documented hitting blue whales and other whales. It's not clear to us yet uh, whether them going on the other side of the islands uh, significantly reduces the risk to whales or not. So we're actually working with the Navy and with the National Marine Fisheries Service doing some aerial surveys on the back side of the islands of large whales to start looking at the densities on that side and where they are located compared to where the ships are going now and trying to assess whether uh, them going on the back side of the islands reduces the risk of whale strikes or, or does not. So that's kind of an open question right now. Sure. The eelgrass, uh, we have maps on our website. Uh, one, they tend to be in places people love to anchor, like Scorpion Harbor, um, Betcher's Bay, all the soft, bottom, calm areas that are the best places to anchor are typically where you'll find it. We have eelgrass maps on our website, links to that. And we've actually got an eelgrass brochure. And we, for anybody, if you know a boater out there, um, it would be great for them to get those brochures and try to avoid um, the, the high density eelgrass areas because when, when you put an anchor down in eelgrass, you pull up the anchor, it just rips out all the eelgrass by your anchor, but as well as your boat scours around in circles with the wind, it creates the chain, creates a big scour and uh, just tears out all the eelgrass. So when you dive down there, you can immediately see where someone's anchored and just torn it all up. So, we're trying to do a little outreach on that so that boaters are more aware of you know, where to try and be uh, more careful with their anchoring. Do you observe any negative effects on the ecosystem of the abundant natural seepages of oil and gas, or they are too far away from the sanctuary? Uh, there are actually a l number of studies looking at how much natural seepage of oil and gas there is, and there's a large amount, actually. Uh, not a lot There's of it the gets population. to the islands, and there doesn't seem to be any significant measurable impact at the islands. There is some impact closer to the to seep areas, for sure. Good. So we should probably wrap it up there. Okay. And